Welcome. I'm Jerry Sonneson, and I'm head of the Department of Philosophy and World Religions uh, here at UNI. And I'd like to welcome you uh, all to our lecture this afternoon. This afternoon, uh, we are all here for the farewell lecture of one of our department's most enduring and endearing <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> I mean, look at you all. This is <laughs> wonderful. He certainly is endearing. Uh, Bill Cloacy, professor of philosophy. This is something of a bittersweet event for me. <laughs> I'm too tired to tell you it's not necessary. <laughs> it's a good interruption. Uh, On the one hand, uh, I have known and appreciated Bill for over 25 years as a senior colleague in my department. A colleague who shares quite similar interests in ethics and the study of Immanuel Kant and in American pragmatism. And this afternoon we are saying farewell, recognizing the retirement at the end of the semester uh, uh, of his or from his professional duties at UNI after some 30 years of committed work. This is a loss to me and to our department and university and especially to our students. On the, one, uh, on the other hand, this is an occasion to celebrate the wonderful and productive career Bill has had at UNI. And so this is also, this is also an occasion of joy and thanksgiving. Professor Closey hails from my very own hometown, Chicago. Those of us from Chicago know firsthand just why Chicago is called the Windy City. You might think, perhaps reasonably, that it's because of the strong wind that does, in fact, come off of Lake Michigan. But no. <laughs> no, indeed. Rather, it is, well, well, it's because of Chicago politics. You know, a whole hell of a lot of hot air. <laughs> yes, all good folks from Chicago have experienced lots of politics, and perhaps this is one of the reasons Professor Cloacy gained an interest in political philosophy early on. He first studied philosophy as an undergraduate student at Loyola University in Chicago, and then as a master's student at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. He eventually had the good fortune to study political philosophy as a doctoral student at the New School of Social Research in New York City, graduating in 1981. Professor Closey spent his first year teaching at Montclair State College in New Jersey, and then another year at his alma mater, Loyola, Loyola University of Chicago. He then taught at Rochester Institute of Technology from 1983 to 1987, before joining the Department of Philosophy and Religion here at UNI in the fall 1987, as assistant professor of philosophy. He was promoted to associate professor in 1993 and then again to the rank of full professor in 2006. Professor Cloacy's specialties are in philosophical ethics and political theory. And he has made quite a reputation at UNI teaching such courses as ethics, ethics in public policy, Society, Politics, and the Person, and History of Philosophy, Modern. His popularity as a teacher is evident in the fact that his introductory course, Philosophy, the Art of Thinking, 
has often been the first to fill when registration opens up. <clears throat> Hearing rumors about his popularity when I first came to you and I, I went to him for advice. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your secret, I asked. He thought for a moment, and then, with a smile and a little twinkle in his eye, <laughs> and a slight, ever so slight, Irish accent, <laughs> he said, well, I give them points for discussion. <laughs> You can bet that went on my syllabus the next <laughs> <time>. <laughs> Professor Clovisy's expertise as a teacher, in fact, gained international po polish when in the summer of 1994, he served on the faculty uh, of the Salzburg Global Seminar for a program on democracy and non-governmental organizations offered to a group of international fellows. The mission of this international seminar, which continues today, is to help future international leaders solve challenges to large systems, such as political and business systems confronting the next generation. Professor Closey has also published widely in philosophy. His areas of interest in publication include Greek philosophy, Immanuel Kant, business ethics, ethics and altruism in nonprofit business, and various ethical issues in American democracy. One of his most important commitments guiding his career in research and teaching is what we call today uh, engaged learning. The effort to engage and to be engaged in a larger community with individuals, institutions, and practices for the purpose of learning about and reflecting upon and reconstructing these matters. So, having taught ethics in business for a number of years, in 1992, he organized a several day conference at UNI entitled Ethics at Work, a symposium on the worker and the workplace, which included academic scholars, union workers in Iowa, and administrators in various businesses around Iowa. Then in 1995, he applied for and secured a large grant from the Kellogg Foundation to institute what we called SERV, which stands for Service, Ethical Reflection, and Vocational Exploration. This was a project on service learning for students and a series of faculty seminars on ethics in volunteerism, on philanthropy and on the service sector. This three-year project helped to educate both faculty and students regarding service in the workplace, supporting new courses and scholarship in this area. For the outstanding work he has done in teaching research and service, Professor Cloacy in 2001 received the Regents Award for Faculty Excellence. He certainly has been an excellent colleague over the years, and a first-rate teacher for our students. We are indeed fortunate that his career is not quite yet at its end. <laughs> this afternoon, we have the good fortune to hear his farewell lecture, Socrates and Kant, The Need for Dialogue in Ethics. After this lecture, uh, and a brief question and answer period, you are all invited to uh, our retirement reception for him right across the hallway here in the great reading room. But now, please help me welcome our colleague, teacher, and friend, Bill Close. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I was going to say it's a delight to be doing this, but I'm not sure. 
Uh, <laughs> Uh, it is figuratively my last lecture. It is not literally my last lecture. So anyone who's here from class, I will have class on Monday. Um, be before I start, I, um, I, wa I want to say a, a few words about a very close friend of mine uh, and a colleague for many years. James Robinson, who um, was also planning to retire this semester and uh, had decided not to do one of these, but he, he, he was going to retire. And unfortunately, he, uh, uh, he passed away uh, at the beginning of, of this school term. Uh, James was a very good friend of mine, uh, a wonderful teacher. Uh, he, he could turn anything into a story, and, and would, and he absol and absolutely loved hearing stories because he would use them later. Uh, so I, uh, my, my, my one regret today is that he's not here for this. I would have greatly uh, been, been very happy had he been here. Um, usually when I, when I give a public lecture, I want to do something uh, quite new something that, that, that will take the audience places where they, they haven't been. Um, but this is an unusual lecture. As I look around the room, I see a great many former students, as well as some present students, and, and a lot of uh, friends. And I, I decided that what I want to do today is, in part, um, redolent of work I've been doing as a teacher here. Uh, but also have a, 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 an original twist to it. But I, I don't want to go into something that's, that's utterly uh, separate and, and apart and brand new, because this is, after all, my last lecture. Um, it's not unreasonable to propose that Western ethics begins with the dialogues of Socrates, with his friends and opponents seeking definitions of virtue and questioning why we act as we do. Socrates prods his interlocutors uh, to go beyond what they've learned and to say uh, toward solving particular problems by speaking clearly about them so as to bring to light and define specific virtues that are, are present there. He repeatedly fails to get what he wants although the conversations can be informative in many ways. You, you can divide the Plato's dialogues into two groups, the Socratic dialogues, which all end in confusion, and the, the Platonic dialogues, in which Plato is the real presence. And those all end with uh, theories that are, are very well crafted. Um, there are several dialogues, however, in which he speaks of an inner voice, Socrates speaks of an inner voice that warns, warns him away from actions that would cause harm. Kant offers a new approach to ethics by stressing human autonomy. Ethics does not come from authorities drawing upon nature or revelation. Ethics begins rather in moral autonomy. Humans determine for themselves how and why they act as they do. We learn the moral law not from the study of nature, the insights of revelation, or our physical structure, or the teaching of moral authorities. We learn the moral law by our own thoughtful response and by those of others to moral problems. We're collectively the source of the moral law within us and the moral world around us. Socrates and Kant do not offer the same form of ethical reflection, but there are parallels between them worth a careful look. In both cases, there is an active reflection that goes on among moral agents as well as one within the mind of each philosopher. That is, there is a dialogue that might begin with others, but it continues to important effect within the thought of the moral agents themselves. If it is this latter dialogue that concerns me today, with Socrates first. 
Socrates is a creation of Athenian democracy, as he himself says in the Credo. Uh, Socrates is a sophist. He was a philosopher who um, participated in the quest for truth, but he wanted to use that truth in Athens for practical purposes, which was unusual among philosophers. He wanted to approach the, the polis by addressing the city's problems in his own cantankerous way. Socrates is a devoted citizen of Athens, but he differs significantly from other Athenians in his approach to the city's problems. He engages in endless conversations on public affairs, chiefly upon the nature of the virtues that the citizens must possess uh, to face their problems. But he avoids the assembly where public discourse chiefly takes place. He occasionally was in the assembly and got in trouble each time he was uh, and, and did not really want to go back. He didn't like the assembly at all. Um, his conversations outside the assembly were public discussions as well uh, anyway. For wherever citizens gathered and talked about public affairs, about virtue, and how to live in a city, they were doing public uh, speech. They were acting as citizens. As Aristotle would put it two generations later, humans are animals with speech, and thereby we are political animals. Citizens lived their lives fully through the constant talk that was their polis life. Political discussion went on through the exchange of opinions on how things seemed to them. So the polis was a public space outside the household. And the, the heads of the household, the despotes, which is the name for the head of the household. The, uh, the Greeks thought that Persia was a despotism because they thought that the king of Persia had made the entire country his household and everyone in it his slaves. Hence, they used the word despot for him. But the, the, the word basically simply means a head of a household, although it, it does describe something about how they lived and, and the, the way they treated the others in the household. But what was important was that they were able to leave the household and act together as citizens, act together so that uh, through them the city would prosper, through them the, the problems of the city could be solved. And um, the way in which they did that was first of all, maintain equality among them, rigorous equality among them. Because if anyone was superior to another, there, the conversation of the one who was inferior wouldn't mean anything. They had to be equals if they were going to be political. So they were. And um, the way in which they dealt with the uh, affairs of the city was through opinions. And for them, opinions, uh, Greek is doxai, and doxai, com or doxa, comes from um, dokemoi, it seems to me. So it's how things seem to me is an opinion. And everyone had their opinions, how the world seemed to them, how the city seemed to them. And the city uh, progressed, the, the, the public uh, progressed through the exchange of opinions. People would talk about how they saw things and learn from others how they did. And among themselves, they would, they would develop a larger picture of what the city was doing, of, what, of the condition of the city, of what needed to be done in the city. So the exchange of opinion was of extraordinary purpose. Uh, it was the way in which politics was done. Um,
opinion, or doxa, actually had two meanings. One was opinion. The other was reputation. Because when a citizen opened his mouth, and they were all men, when a citizen opened his mouth, other people could judge him. Other people could measure what he was saying. Other people could give him a reputation. When a citizen acted, people could watch, see what was going on, and give the person a reputation. So a, what part of opinion was reputation of the citizens, how they saw one another. And uh, the, the, the city would advance because some people would come up with ideas, would come up with opinions on what they ought to do that people thought to be very sound, very promising. And those people would become leaders. And they would be in charge of some project because they had proposed it in the assembly. And it would be carried out by them along with followers. The followers who were willing to work with them in order to put into effect their, their project. What that shows is that while people with good opinions, good projects, become leaders, they become leaders because there are people who are willing to be their followers. It's the followers who come first. It's the followers who make leaders, not the other way around. So the, the, city, the city worked quite well this way. Though uh, it, it had the problem that uh, all di direct democracies have of uh, people forming cliques and, and making enemies and things like that. Uh, Socrates was a philosopher, and for him, Participating in this was dreadful, <laughs> uh, and he tended not to do it. He wasn't very good at it anyway, but he tended not to do it because he wasn't interested in exchanging opinions with people he didn't know or people he didn't respect. He wasn't interested in dealing in opinions. He, being a philosopher, he wanted what philosophers wanted, which was truth. And unlike opinion, truth doesn't change. Unlike opinion, truth is not dependent upon those who have it. It, it is its own thing. And people, if they are wise, will attempt to learn it. And the way in which Socrates does this is attempt to find the, the ideas, the ideas of the virtues the definitions of the virtues. The word idea in, in Attic Greek meant uh, a pattern. Socrates was, uh, by training, a stonemason. So the fact that he used the word is not surprising. It would have been a commonplace for him. And what he meant by idea was a definition of a virtue such that knowing it, one could follow it and do the right thing because you had the pattern. And that's what he saw. He never discovered any. But that's, that was his purpose in life, to, di to discover the, 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 the ideas of the virtues. Because if, 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 they, if they were found, everybody would know what to do. If they had to be courageous, they could be. If they had to be wise, they could be. But that, that was Socrates' approach to the world. And it's what he, he tried to do. In his, in his discussions with people around um, Athens. Um, it is apology, in fact. So, uh, the, the apology is, uh, the word does not mean in Greek what it means in English. His apology was the, the uh, statement he made at his trial. He was put on trial for... Um, uh, failure to believe in the city's gods and for corrupting the youth. And uh, he, just, he, he managed to show very quickly 
that they were baseless charges. Uh, but he, uh, he didn't sit down and let the jury vote. He, he figured, he was 70 years old, which, uh, believe me, is old. Um, <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he took advantage of the audience, the 501 jurors. He took advantage of the audience with whoever else was there to explain himself. And apologia in Greek means that. It means an explanation of one's life or a, a defense of one's life. So that rather than sit down and be acquitted, he decided to tell them why he had done what he had done throughout his life. And in doing so, managed to, to say a few things that were, were insulting to Athenians and got himself executed because of it. Um, in the Apology, in fact, Socrates suggests that he would have faced death long ago were, to, were he to have been a participant in the assembly. Um, something happened to Socrates due to this constant questioning of his fellow citizens and others. In his Apology, his defense or explanation of his life at his trial for impiety and corruption of the youth. Socrates lays down a sentence or two sentences he will not accept from the jury. He tells him that if they, if they say to him he can stay in Athens so long as he keeps quiet and gives up philosophy, he will say, Gentlemen of Athens, I respect you, I admire you, you are my friends, but I will tell you no. I will not do that. If they offer to him that he can go into exile, he says the same thing. He has lived his life in Athens, he will die in Athens. He will not spend his last years roaming around looking for a place to live. A very real question arises in this. Given the fact that Athenians found their substance, found their reputation in the eyes of their fellow citizens, how could Socrates turn on his fellow citizens and say this to them? It would seem to be that for most Athenians, and I don't think there's much question, for most Athenians, such behavior was utterly unprecedented, utterly impossible to comprehend. He was doing what no citizen could do. Uh, and I think the, the reason for that is, is an, uh, an important one to search out. In the um, handout, You have a um, you have a quote from uh, Plato's Gorgias. This is a Platonic dialogue, but this this quotation in it is a very odd one, because it doesn't fit well in what Plato is saying. But it's there, as though Plato knew it and had no choice but to put it in. He wanted to keep it. So it was almost certainly a, a quotation from Socrates, not a, a, a quotation from Plato's thought. I would rather that my lyre or some chorus in which I would sing be out of tune and discordant, or that a great many people disagree with me and speak in opposition to me, than that I, being one, should be out of harmony with and in opposition to myself. At first, it seems like a straightforward statement. Until you realize what he's saying. I being one should be, then that I being one should be out of harmony with and in opposition to myself. How can that be? Can you sing harmony all by yourself? No. You can sing a melody all by yourself. But you can't sing harmony. You need more than one person to sing harmony. And I think that's the point that he was getting at there. That I being one should be out of harmony with myself. 
is a very strange statement, and it's, and it's the being one. That's remarkable. Yes, he's one, but he can be out of harmony with himself even though he is one, precisely because he's a two-in-one. He's both himself, he's both himself and he's a witness to himself. He's both himself and he's a critic to himself. And if he does something that makes him ashamed of himself, he has to live with that. He knows what he's done. And he can't, he can't forget it because he will keep reminding himself that he did it. So that something happened to Socrates that was quite remarkable. He, he, within his own head, within his own mind, he became two people, an agent and a critic. And because of that, he had no choice but to act in a way such that he could live with himself. It was a limitation on him that was, uh, that was profound. Um, so it, it, what most people would find is that for them, they are a one. And the harmony doesn't come up. They're either doing what they think is right or they're doing what they think is wrong. And they can, uh, they can explain it to themselves. They can attempt to forget it. But as long as, as he is both a witness and an agent, he can't. He has to live with it. And that puts a limitation on him. He can only act in such a way that he can be a friend to himself. Uh, anything else that he does, uh, he won't be a friend to himself. And life will be very, very hard. Not because of what others say or what others do, but because of what he himself will say. And he himself will, will say it because he can't avoid saying it. There's a um, small um, dialogue called The Hippias Maior. It's a minor dialogue. It might not even have been written by Plato. Um, <clears throat> what goes on in the, in the Hippias Maior is that uh, Hippias is a, uh, a fellow who makes a living by singing Homer. He goes to people's homes for feasts, and when they're done eating, he comes out with his lyre and he sings. And he and Socrates are having a discussion about... Um, about beauty. And Socrates says to Hippias, I have to get this right. What exactly did you say? And so he makes Hippias re re repeat what he's saying. And he does it again and again. Finally, Hippias is sick and tired of it. And he says, why are you doing this? Why does it matter? And Socrates says, well, there's this old man who lives with me. And when I go home at night, he questions me about what I've done all day. <laughs> and he simply will not leave me alone until I have answered all of his questions. And I have no choice. I've got to get this right because he is going to ask. <laughs> and Hippias says, that's an awful way to live. Why don't you throw him out? And Socrates said, oh, I couldn't do that. He's very close to me. <laughs> so I think what, what you have there is Socrates doing this remarkable thing that he did. I don't think he fully understood it. Uh, he, he talked about it as a god that had come to him since he was a youth and, and had warned him away when he was about to do things that were wrong. But uh, we, we can say that this was him reflecting upon himself. What, how fully he understood that or not, we don't know. But um, the question that arises is, how is he as an interlocutor with himself? 
And the Hippias gives us a suggestion. He, he's a, a, a damn crotchety uh, interlocutor. Um, in the Credo, you see him at work again. Uh, Credo, Credo has, he's in the prison waiting to be executed. And Credo is a friend of his, a wealthy friend, who comes to him early in the morning and he says that he's, he's paid all of the right people off and they can get Socrates out of Athens. So Socrates should come with him. And Socrates said, well, before we do that, we have to make sure that my escaping from Athens is what I ought to do. And Credo said, why? It's obvious that you've been, you've been wronged. The, the sentence was unjust. Uh, certainly you want to get away. No, not really. And, and Credo says, well, you have to, because all of us who have put our money together, if you don't go away, if you don't escape, people are going to think that we were too cheap to help. <laughs> and Socrates said, I really don't care about that, <laughs> and, and neither should you that if I am going to escape, we have to, we have to convince ourselves that it's the right thing for me to do, that it's just. And he goes on and he said, remember what I said at, at, at the trial. I said that if, if, you, uh, if you told me I, I could go in, into exile, I, I said no. I would not spend my last years wandering around Greece. Athens was my home. I said that. Can I walk out now, having said that? If I do, I will make everything I have said worthless. If I do, I will, I will be making a laughing stock of the, of the court so that I'm not at all sure that I can leave. And if you're going to talk me into it, you have got to explain to me how my leaving would not be something I would be ashamed of doing. And uh, Credo tries and, and doesn't get anywhere. And, and so Socrates gives up on him and, and begins, talking, um, begins talking not to him, but to the laws of Athens. So imagine that the laws of Athens were here and I could talk directly to them. What would they say to me? What they would say would be something like, we have raised you from childhood. You are who you are because you grew up in Athens. And now because of this injustice that a few men have brought upon you, you're willing to leave and make us a laughing stock? That's all you think of us? And Socrates said, I, I can't do that. And uh, I, I think I gave you a, yes, in the Credo, uh, in the handout, my dear Credo, your eagerness is worth much if it should have some right aim. If not, then the greater your keenness, the more difficult it is to deal with. The more excited you are, the, the more of a nuisance you are. And the laws say to him, uh, to do so is right, and, mon, one, and must not, one must not give way or retreat or leave one's post, but both in war and in courts and everywhere else. This is what a citizen does. In war and in courts and everywhere else, one must obey the commands of one's city or country or persuade it as to the nature of justice. If you wanted a different outcome, you should have persuaded us that you deserved a different outcome. You didn't. That's how we rule here, by persuasion. Not by brutality, by persuasion. And he said, if I, if I leave, I'm leaving with all of that being said and my dismissing it as insignificant. So that one of the, the lesson I think we learn about Socrates from the Hippias and from the Credo is that while he's a two in one, the, the interlocutor that he creates is a tough one. The interlocutor that he creates is someone who is really a good challenger, someone who makes him think, someone who makes him answer well, 
and not someone who simply enables him to say whatever is needed at the moment. So Socrates' two-in-one is, is a, a very useful, very powerful tool in his hands. But it's a tool in his hands. He talks about it in terms of himself. He doesn't seem fully to understand where it came from. He, talk, he calls it a god. And he says he, it's been with him since he was a youth. And it makes, when he's about to do something wrong, it stops him. As a consequence, he does not try to teach this to anybody else. He doesn't try to get other Athenians to uh, generate a two-in-one of their own. Rather, um, he does this for himself, and for the others, he wants the ideas. If he could get them to have the truth, then they could simply follow those designs, and they wouldn't have to think. All they would have to do is work carefully. So Socrates has a dialogue, but it's a dialogue with himself, and it's not something that he is really able to share or to teach to others. It's a remarkable occurrence. It, it had never appeared before. Uh, it does appear a little bit after Socrates. His friend uh, Sophocles uh, makes use of it in a couple of his plays. In the Medea, for example. Uh, Medea has, is a foreigner who had married Jason. They, they come to a Greek city and Jason falls in love with the, uh, the princess. The, the king of the city wants Jason to be his heir. And so Jason abandons Medea and her children, their children, and, and goes off to, to the palace to, uh, to marry the, the princess and become king. Well, Medea is furious. And she is looking desperately for some way to get back at Jason for having done this to her. Uh, the first way she does it is to, to fashion a crown for his, uh, his betrothed, and it's got pins in it that will go into her head, and the pins are covered with poison. So when she gets this gift and she puts it on her head, she kills herself. Uh, Medea, Medea is not someone to be toyed with. Um, <laughs> her, her, next, her next decision... To, in terms of getting back at Jason for abandoning her, concerns their three children. The one thing that she could do that would really hurt Jason would be to kill those children. And the, the brunt of the play is about her thinking over what she's going to do with those children. She argues it out with some advisors, and they don't come to a resolution, the advisors leave. She argues it out with the chorus. They don't come to a resolution, the chorus leaves. And she's there on the stage all alone, and she says, I cannot help it, I have to do this. And she kills them. So there she is having an argument with herself at the end. She is doing something very much like Socrates, but Nothing else comes from that. It, it doesn't become a movement in Greek thinking. And the Western ethics that followed Socrates did not take that path. It wasn't a matter of reflection. It was a matter of laws, a matter of uh, defining the good, defining evil, defining uh, uh, various, uh, various virtues and the like. The closest to Socrates and his daimon, his, his, his uh, voice, and I think a true descendant of him, is Immanuel Kant. He's the next person who does something like this. Kant's ethics is a part of a larger investigation of human reason, the discovery and delineation of how and by what inbuilt structure our reason approaches its tasks in learning about the world, making moral judgments, and recognizing and appreciating purpose and beauty, where we find them. Kant intends to discover the way in which our reason asks questions about nature, ethics, and beauty. For Kant, 
the mind is not the passive recipient of the experience of the world around and within us. There are organizational principles inherent in the mind, the categories, and that all persons use those to understand and to, to give voice to their experience. You can look at what Kant is doing this way, I think. You have uh, in Kant, you have sensation and you have reason. In terms of knowledge, there are certain inbuilt structures causation, substance and accidents, um, reciprocity. Fundamental, character, uh, fundamental categories that are uh, intrinsic to the human mind. Some of you might be familiar with Jean Piaget, the Swiss psychologist. His work with, still, with, with children was to uncover these categories and find at what point children get them and how they get them. But uh, So there are these categories. And we use them, we apply them to our experience of the world, our sensations. And what we create out of them is a world. It's a world that we understand. It's a world that we can talk about. The categories make it possible for us to speak about the world. And uh, the world it, itself is what we call nature. But nature is not something that's given. It's not something that is there for us to investigate. Nature is rather the project that we as human beings undertake. And it's a project that we undertake and have undertook as long as we have had speech. We have, we have been about the business of creating nature. And um, so for, for Kant, to understand the world is to understand the activity by which we bring it into coherence. Ethics is built upon nature. When, when, we, when we make moral judgments, moral reason, we are acting upon the same sensible world and what we are intent on doing is bringing about a world in which we not only live, but can live in terms of moral principles so that the world is a, a place for us. The world has been transformed from nature into an intelligible world, a world in which, uh, in which our, our morality makes sense because it, we apply it. We create that world, and that's the creation of morality. So that the intelligible world of, of morality is something that we bring into being ourselves, just as we bring nature into being. Um, and the way all of this works, starting with, with nature, the way in which uh, nature works is that we form hypotheses. We form proposals about how things fit together. And we, we try them out. Um, we do experiments using them to see if the experiments actually show that we've got the right formulas. We've, we've got things together as they really are. And if we do, the experiments should prove that what we have been saying, in fact, was right. So the experiments will show that we're on the right track if they work. If they, if they don't work, we know that we're on the wrong track. And we have to come up with another hypothesis and try to, to use that and see if it works. So that what, uh, what we do in, in science, what we do in everyday life, is um, try, try to make a world that's objective. Try, 
try to make a world that is true, the statements we make about it are true for all of us. It's something that we can, we can accept. There, there will come a time when the, the statements become too simplistic. We've become more, um, uh, uh, we've become better at, at making instruments. We've come up with better ideas for experiments. And we find that what we used to think was right isn't. So we change it to something else. But what, what, al what always works, or, or what always directs us, is finding statements that work finding statements that are objectively true. They're true whether we want them to be true or not. It might be in our own personal interest for a, uh, an, an, a, 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 an experiment to come out in a different way. But if it doesn't, there's nothing we can do about it. We can't hide it. We can't simply fail to mention it. There are other people who are doing the same research, so it's going to come out. And that's what objectivity is um, in your handout. The first one is about objectivity. Therefore, objective validity and necessary universal validity, validity for everybody, are equivalent terms. And though we do not know the object in itself, yet when we consider a judgment, as universally valid and hence as necessary, we thereby understand it to have objective validity. When we find that judgments we make, we have to make. We are, do we are doing something that's objective. That's what it means. Now, in ethics, we begin with a very fundamental fact. Duty, obligation. It's something that we all experience. <coughs> it's something that is very, very, very deep, very primordial. Everyone except a few psychopaths have the experience of duty. There are times when we realize, I really ought to do this. I might not want to, but I really ought to do this. I can't get out of it. And that's something that shows in us that we are able to do things not just because we are moved to do them, or we need to do them, or we want to do them, but we do them because we realize, given the context in which they occur and in which we are living, we really ought to do them. And so we do. So Kant begins with this basic experience of duty the recognition that some action is one that I ought to perform, whether I want to or not. Kant's ethics can perhaps best be quickly presented as, uh, and understood by focusing upon this core principle and upon what he called the categorical imperative. If you look at the second side of your uh, handout, the first quote there is the one on... Um, Ah, um, all imperatives, well, we'll get to that in a minute. The, uh, the first quote on the first side was about objective validity. Validity valid for everybody. On the second, we have the uh, metaphysics of morals. Because we are capable of morality, and it's a matter of our reason. We begin with moral reason or practical reason. And what that does, according to Kant, is present us with imperatives. There are things that we ought to do. When, and when we're thinking, that's how we think to ourselves. There are things that I really ought to do. Things that I, I have to do them if I want what I want. There are things that I have to do if I want to live with the people I live with. So there are uh, imperatives. It's 
Some are hypothetical. If I want B, I must do A. So that's a, sub that's a subjective one. It depends upon my interest. If I'm not all that interested in B, well, I might not bother doing A. If I really want B, I'll do A. But it's up to me. That's one kind of imperative, and it's one that we're all familiar with. We do it all the time. Uh, there's another kind. Categorical imperatives. These are imperatives that are not a matter of our desire or our interest. There are times when we are faced with situations that require us to act. My, my favorite example is if you're walking along a beach and there's a, 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 a pier in the distance and you see a small child fall off the end of a pier, well, something needs to be done. The child's got to be saved. If you're close enough, you can run out to the end of the pier and dive in and get the kid. If you're not, you have to do something else. You maybe call out, use your phone, wave at somebody, something. So that, that there's something has happened that requires a response. And what that response is depends upon the person. If you're there and you can dive in and you can't swim, you probably shouldn't. Uh, but the categorical imperative is one that gives us a situation and says, because of it, I ought to do A. That's, that's an objective imperative. That's one that requires something of me. It's not a matter of my druthers. It's a matter that this is, this is a situation that's serious. This is situ a situation in which I must act. I ought to act. Um, and we, we, we're all familiar with those. And for Kant, that's the basis of ethics, that we have those imperatives. We have these, these experiences of duty, and they give rise to these imperatives. Um, We're in a position when we're faced with a categorical imperative of accountability. Someone might ask us later, what did you do? Why did you do it? So that if I, if I simply ignored it, or I said, well, I didn't want to get my shoes wet, um, that it would be something that we really wouldn't want to give an account of. Whereas if we did what we could, we'll give an account of it. So that uh, for, for Kant, the, fund the fundamental character of us as rational beings is our, our capacity to use language. The fundamental characteristic of us that makes us moral beings is our capacity for accountability. We, can, we are willing to be held accountable by others. Others demand to hold us accountable for what we do or don't do. And that's where uh, we find ethics, in the accountability. That what we are doing is something that we can, in fact, and in fact we must, be willing to account for to others. Now, there are a number of kinds of categorical imperatives. In your handout, um, I wrote down three of them. The first one, act only according to the maxim by which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. In other words, whatever it is I decide to do, I, it should be such that I would be willing to express it publicly, and I would expect everybody to agree, yeah, that's the right thing for you to do. 
So the, the objectivity of it is the, the publicness of it, my ability to account for it, my ability to say this is what I ought to do. So act only on that maxim, that personal decision by which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. In this condition, in this case, it's something that I would be satisfied if everybody did. The second one, act so that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in that of another, always as an end and never as a means only. We are all persons, but we're also things. Things are such that we can use them. We use one another all the time. That's what teachers do with students and the students do with teachers. You, you, you provide us with a, a, a reason for getting paid and we provide you with, with knowledge that hopefully someday will, will, uh, will, will be important to you. <laughs> so we use one another all the time and just as we use things. But beyond that, there is something about persons that is more than a thing. There is something about us that limits the use others can make of us. I can, I can make demands of someone who's working for me, but at the same time I have to realize that that person has a life of his or her own. That person has a family. That person has a right to certain kinds of treatment. That has a right to get paid, things like that. Um, slavery is probably the best example of failing to treat persons as ends because a slave becomes the, the utensil of the slave owner. Um, one of the things with, with slaves in the antebellum South, uh, slave owners rarely recognize marriages between slaves. The, the slaves had rituals by which they married, and they had children, they, and they were a family. Everybody, re all of the other slaves recognized them as a family. But the owners rarely did, because if the owners recognized them as a family, they couldn't sell one of them if the opportunity came up. They would have to recognize that they're a unit and they have to be treated that way. So it wasn't in their interest to treat them as a family. It wasn't in their interest to notice that they did things like get married and have children. They had to be treated merely as property so that they were always saleable. So this is the, the second form of uh, the categorical imperative. It's one that's aimed directly at a kind of problem, the failure to treat persons as persons, to treat them as mere things. The third one deals with more complicated organizations, and I, we can leave that for next time. Uh, <laughs> yes. So that um, what we find in Kant is a, 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 an effort to provide us with a way of thinking so that within ourselves we can generate moral thought so that within ourselves we can generate moral convictions, so that within ourselves we can determine that some things are good and some things simply we cannot do them. And it's something that we do for ourselves, within ourselves, we do for one another in conversation and in teaching and in things like politics, but it, it, it's a, uh, a way of thinking that we can use together in dialogue that enables us to pinpoint some things that we ought to do and some that we ought not. And we can do it within ourselves to always, to always hold ourselves to the standards of doing what is right as we see it. So that what Kant does is to take Socrates' brilliant insight that he's a two-in-one He's able both to act and to reflect upon and criticize the action. What Kant attempted to do was to take that and universalize it. Everybody can do that. 
not just geniuses, not just philosophers, but everybody, anybody who can think at all is able to, and who is able to think of duty is able to think about what's right and wrong. So allow me to sum up by suggesting that what I see in Kant's ethics is an attempt to present an ethics drawing upon critical argument both internally and with others. Kant's ethics does not seek a grounding that transcends human beings, but one that is based in careful argument and awareness of what is at issue and for whom it matters. A good action should be one that can be defended before others because it has already been argued by the moral agent uh, internally or with others. Kant avoids the danger of transforming human action into set unimaginative work by not seeking a guide external to moral judgments to follow so that we have certainty that what we are doing will be correct. There are no ideas. Ethics is a form of human discourse calling upon us to act with accountability both to ourselves and others. What Socrates had discovered within himself was an inner voice de demanding a running account of his life. Kant has proposed, at least implicitly, as a manner of ethical thought that relies upon such a voice within and among ethical agents generally. Kant lacks the wit and irony of Socrates, and he had no intention of trying to write crisp dialogues. He <laughs> would not have succeeded. Uh, but he had done for all human agents what Socrates realized only in himself, an ethics that seeks to articulate an inner moral voice, making every moral agent answerable to every action and every omission. And then finish this up. We are always making decisions in morality that affect human beings ourselves, others, and organized groups. It might be wiser to take respect for persons, including ourselves, and organizations of lawfully directed groups, always to be crucial to understanding moral problems and making the moral decisions about them. In other words, we should keep those second and third categorical imperatives always in mind. That's what it's really all about, persons and their organizations. We must always be keenly aware of the needs of and dangers to those with whom we interact, no matter how distantly. Our failures will likely be presented to us by those who have learned uh, in painful stories or who have been harmed, rather, in painful stories or accusations due to our thoughtless and narrow attention to our own interests alone. Our successes can also be displayed through the stories of people who have been helped and saved by our doing what we ought to have done for them. Stories, accusations, warnings, and tributes are all ways we can express to one another, as well as to ourselves, the fact that our deeds really do have an effect in the world that is palpable, memorable, and retrievable through telling about them and therefore telling about ourselves. We ought to remember and repeat these stories as part of the dialogue we have with ourselves and with one another when we are arguing a way to future moral issues. Thank you. Are there questions? <laughs> this is a room filled with philosophers. There must be some. <laughs> Bill, should we have just one minute for people to leave if they? Oh, leave? that's a good idea. Okay, then, then we can have the questions. Have All right. Take a moment for those to leave who need to.
sure. Are there questions? Yes, Sean. What about the people that do not engage themselves in the categorical imperative? How do you explain the people that just don't do it? I mean, what are they deficient or are they just stubborn? Are they psychopaths? No, no. I think they um, they they don't pay attention to what's going on around them. They don't see the moral quality of it. And they're just not used to doing that. And if you, if you live a long time by ignoring that, it makes it very hard to see it again. If, you're, if your own personal interests are very, very strong, it makes it very hard to realize that your own personal interests are not anyone else's interests, too. So that a, a lot of people don't think this way, because for one reason or another, it's simply never it's never been required of them, and they've never had the opportunity to start it. Too much else has, has um, interfered. Did he ever bring an explanation as to why that would be? Is it not, I mean, his upbringing, his lack of wisdom? Is Things like that, yeah. Upbringing has a good part to do with it. That if you, if you are taught very early that, that there are such things as duty, that you, you are responsible. You're responsible for uh, doing your own work. You're responsible for your younger brothers and sisters. You're responsible for this and that. If, if that's an early part of your, uh, uh, your experience, it's much easier to realize that you are among people who, um, who, who have problems. You're among people, some of whom you're responsible for. You're among people who have needs. And you're uh, more likely to respond to the needs because it's something that you've done. It's something that you've been doing ever since you were a kid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Thinking in terms of duty can kind of close us off towards others. Mm. Cut short a thought of what someone else's experience is or how we might need to help them in an unusual circumstance. And that rather it's capacities like sympathy or compassion that really enable us to mm -hmm. think uh, vividly and well. Yeah, there, yeah, there, are, um, there are emotions that are of extraordinary importance because they help us uh, connect with other people that we, that we would not connect with intellectually or might not connect with intellectually. And it, it is one of Kant's greatest weaknesses. It's not until the metaphysics of morals that he finally comes down to realize there are emotions that are important morally and they can be developed. They, they're, not emotion, they're, they're not all emotions that overwhelm us or distract us. Some of us make us aware of what's going on, make us able to do what we should be doing. Yeah, and he's not very good at that. He's a little bit too Prussian at that. That he's, it, it, it's, you, you do what you're supposed to do and, and emotion's not supposed to uh, enter into it. Well, no, it's not that simple. Emotions actually um, help us to see what we might overlook. I think you could argue either way, that, that uh, if, if you develop your emotions well, then they become part of your understanding of the world, then, so that when you, when you think, you also have these emotions. And it, uh, you, can, it, you can do it the other way around, 
so that you think and then you have emotions about what you're doing and you allow those emotions to come in and sort of uh, underline the importance of it. But I, I, I think the best way would be to make the emotions part of, of, of the thinking in the first place. And, and, and reading Rousseau, lear one learns how to do that better <laughs> than Kant ever, ever did. Yes? If a non-philosopher can ask a question. Um, I, I was interested in the, the thing about, um, you know, always treating, any, always treating others as me, as, as that and, me. Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden, you moved it from the individual other to organization to mm -hmm. and And I'm totally with you on the individual, but when it gets to organizations of humans, Mm -hmm. Like um, you know, Target or yeah. uh, mm -hmm. the National Rifle Association, mm -hmm. or I think uh, a whole group. I think to myself, why do I have to treat them as ends? Why can't I just treat Target as a means? You know, I'm going to go there. And, well, you can. And, and, yeah. and I'm not going to worry about the feelings of the corporate headquarters or whatever. I'm just going to go there and shop. Yeah, there, there, an organization is not itself a person. I, I know that goes against a lot of a lot of law. <laughs> but that's partly why I asked the question. Yeah. Because the Supreme Court says that corporations uh, have free speech like individuals. So yeah, and uh, no. I don't understand that. And and corp organizations are important because they, they give us ways of getting things done that are important. And they're instruments. Just as any other kind of instrument, they're a thing. And certainly the people who run them are persons. The people who run them create an organization in which they all have responsibilities. What business ethics is all about is, is examining those responsibilities in corporations. Because otherwise, it's very easy for uh, the, the uh, responsibilities to become merely uh, uh, something that, that is done for the firm and, and the effect it has on people is irrelevant, whether they're employees or whether they're customers or neighbors or whatever. And uh, yeah, the, the, there is no reason why we should allow people to uh, make such a totem of organizations that they get to have a, a being beyond us, that they can be very important. People can fulfill themselves through them, and they should. But that requires a certain kind of corporation. It re just as in, in, in politics, it requires a certain kind of organization politically for the, the, the people who are citizens to be able to fulfill themselves as citizens through the, the structures. Some can, can, some can be such that they destroy the people who live under them. Yet all organizations are like that. And, and they, they, they all follow in a very complicated way the, or they, they all should follow in a very complicated way the recognition that the people they're working with are persons. And they can't forget that. And when, when that happens, you, you, you do find that a certain kind of ethical stance in business begins to, uh, begins to stand out very, very, uh, very explicitly. That uh, you, you cannot say the corporation is of importance because it uh, provides... Uh, profits for the stockholders. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does that, and that's an important part of it. But the stockholders are not the only stakeholders. There are other people who are involved, whether they're workers or whether they, they live downwind or, or uh, whether they're customers or whatever. They all have relationships to the corporation, and they all need to be recognized and treated seriously. There, there was a thing in, in business ethics some time ago called stakeholder theory, that rather than emphasizing stockholders, we should emphasize all of the stakeholders. And, and then we would have a better uh, theory of corporations. That was very popular. Matter of fact, there was a guy at Loyola in Chicago by the name of Boatwright, who was one of the chief uh, proponents of it. Somewhere along the line, it, it, it's gotten forgotten. It's, it's been left in a station somewhere and really needs to be brought back. It got in the way of profits. It got in the way of profits, yeah. Yes? When you were talking about Socrates' cranky old man who lived with him, yes. the word that kept coming to my mind was the word conscience. 
Uh-huh. And I wonder how you would fit the concept of conscience as most of us would understand it into both mm -hmm. Socrates and Kant. With, with Socrates, it, it's problematic. Um, what Socrates is doing there is metaphoric. And one of the things that, that makes studying Greek philosophy fascinating is that you go from, from Homer, who has no concepts whatsoever that are abstract, certainly nothing about the human mind is there at all, up to uh, an, an increasing awareness of it and uh, attempts at describing it. And Socrates, I think, is, is in that, that line. And what he's describing is what we would call the conscience. He wouldn't. He had no word for it, except uh, the voice. The voice that had come to him since he was a boy. And that's all he knew. He, it was a metaphor. I don't think he really understood why he had it or what necessarily what he could do with it. And one of the things that he didn't do with it was try to teach it to others. Because I don't think he had control over it. It just happened. But uh, with, with, with Kant, it was no longer something that just happened. It was something we know we can do, so we should. OK, other questions, comments? Yes? It, 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 it is dependent upon the society. What, what, you're what you're going to talk about, what are the problems, are going to arise because they arise in the society. It, it's, it's not relative in the sense that whatever people happen to say is true, or whatever they all agree on is true. Uh, it, it, different societies have different ways of living, and different problems will arise and people will be accountable for the way they, they approach them, the way they answer problems. They, they will be different, but that doesn't mean that um, they're completely disjointed from one from another. We're always dealing with human beings. We're always dealing with the problems that human beings have, the world they live in, the, the, the fact that they have needs. They, they, they need things in order to live. So in regardless of the culture, the, the same problems arise. And the, the, same method, the same method of dealing with them, of articulating them, and trying to solve them, arise. Make sense? Okay. Yes? Um, I want to say I like very much what you've done. Um, Thank you. Because you place Kant squarely in, in the humanistic tradition by emphasizing this aspect of dialogue. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the reading of Kant that turns him into a logician. Yes. Where it's all, yes. all reduced to attempts to derive postulates of morality from pure reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to say that I see that as entirely in the, in the tradition in which I know you as a humanist. <laughs> um, so it's real. I was just so pleased that I see your trajectory of teaching and of service I see it as entirely consistent with what you did here, and I want to thank you for that trajectory. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. That sounds like a great last question. Yes, I was just thinking the same thing. Um, actually, it's, it's just about 5.30, so that we, uh, we can adjourn to the uh, the room next door and have a reception. Thank you all very much. I appreciate you being here. Thank you.